All right, so we're all good? Yeah. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to Cloud Space. Uh, I've been here before. I know I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I know Jim Mark's here. <laughs> uh, I'm Michael Miller. I'm the VP of Engineering for Cloud Space. And uh, just a couple of side notes. How many of you guys also come out for any of our other uh, meetups? How about the JavaScript one? Okay, so I wanted to start tonight off by letting everybody know, I don't think it'll be next month, because I think we're booked up for next month, right? Yeah. But Caitlin gave a talk and build an application in JavaScript uh, <laughs> the month after. So you have to show up for that one. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of Android folks in the room. How many people in here work with Android on a daily basis in your workplace? Building apps and that kind of stuff. How about iOS? No, I'm just trying to figure out if there's. <laughs> yeah, John, really? yeah, I know John. John works for us. I'm just trying to trying to see what kind of the crossover is. It, it, you know, it's interesting because here in cloud space, uh, I'm an Android guy, and there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of Apple folks in the building, and uh, so it's an interesting uh, dichotomy on a on a daily basis when we start comparing applications. So, but in any case, uh, thank you for coming out. I'll let Caitlin talk, and she'll tell you the date that she's going to give her talk. And you guys tell everybody we want to fill the whole place up that day. So thank you very much. Well, I guess now my ass is doing this, isn't it? Um, <laughs> What's your ass going to be? Huh? What's your ass going to be? I have no idea. Well, you got to tell us and we can start asking for features. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you do have to realize. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you can help me. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll start taking suggestions then. I have no freaking idea what I'm doing, but who knows? We'll see what happens. It. I guess it's going to be in April. So <laughs> second week of April. <laughs> I hate you, Mike. <laughs> All right. On that note. Really quickly, too, how many of you guys know CSS or UI or use, do UX? So if you guys weren't here last week, we, if you guys were, awesome. You guys helped partake in an over 70-plus people attendance. <laughs> um, we blew our attendance rate out of the water. But we had a lot of people who actually asked for us to do a CSS meetup. So in March, there is a fifth Tuesday. Originally, it was going to have that night off. Now it's going to be CSS. So look for each group will get notified of it that I'm creating one, but look for that in the next week because that's going to happen. And then we're going to see how well that goes. And then who knows? We might change some things around. But other than that, I mean, get things rolling. Next week is Ruby. So that'll be another, another fun one. I have another new speaker who hasn't spoken before. So I'm pretty excited about that one, too. I see new people doing it, but all right, Ian, are you ready to do your talk? I'm. Yeah, I'm nice to see new do it. Well, you can't see the same people over and over and over again. Yeah, I know. I get bored of myself. All right, pick yourself up. Get your computer going. What's up, guys? So, what does everybody do? Like, so. Oh man, I can't do this at all. So these two guys are Android devs, but what do you guys actually do? Anybody? Don't go all go, go at once. Just game devs. game devs. Cool. Awesome. Anybody else doing something else? Professional? Is everybody students? Is that what it is? From in PowerShell. All right. That's unusual. Yeah. Are you lost? <laughs> yes, I am. All right. I'm. Uh, there we go. Totally out of it. Yeah, so uh, design patterns. Um, this is kind of like uh, subjective in general, but what I find a lot is like reading through libraries on GitHub and seeing other people's code. So you do a lot of things that get you into a corner and you're going to end up doing work again in the future from just doing something simple poorly. That's kind of like the direction of this talk and just like how you can do a few simple things to save yourself time in the long run and also convey your intent in your code when you're uh, writing Android. So the core application components, hopefully everybody knows these. You're aware generally of Android. 
I know there's a bunch of non-Android people here, so everybody? No? Yeah? Cool. All right. So activities. Uh, activities are basically the core of Android as far as workflow goes. When a user interacts with something, almost activity, something's coming up on the screen and it's controlling the flow of everything that they're going to do. So the, uh, the activities, like I was saying, they control the flow and when you move between events, so you open up the web browser and you click on a web page and then that downloads a PDF, like you're moving between these your components inside of the phone to do very specific work. And one of the things that I find about activities that I see people make mistakes is I'll open up uh, you know, some utility or tool or sample code. The Google I.O. app is a great example of this, where the activity is jam-packed to so much, it's almost impossible to understand what they were doing, why anything works at all. And with like some of the poor naming conventions that I see people use, it becomes really difficult to manage change, and that's where you're going to kill yourself in time, is you're going to make something, you think it's awesome, you show the client, and then they go, that sucks, and they want to change all of this. Well, you just wrote, like, you know, a huge mound of code, so good luck to you on uh, doing that in a reasonable amount of time. So the one place where it is really convenient to write a lot of code is when you work with anything hardware. I do a lot of stuff with Bluetooth and USB. And the activities make a really good place to have the transaction, like transitions between hardware states. Um, work off to services or background threads. Activities provide like useful life understanding what's going on in the foreground, so the background can do something appropriate. Now, fragments. Um, literally, a fragment represents a behavior or a portion of a user interface in an activity. Uh, I would just go ahead and call them compound views. They're not compound views, but that's basically what they are, except with a worse life cycle. Um, at the same time, they do have helpful life cycle hooks, but overall, I think uh, anybody that uses them a lot would say just don't use fragments if you can avoid it. <coughs> as far as how you would use them, um, I would say exactly that. Useful for manipulating data, but never owning it. Um, what I see happen a lot is that you'll have apps with somewhat decentralized data ownership. So there won't be like a database, or maybe there is a database, but there's secondary data storage, like your preferences, um, some kind of state object. And you'll see people make these mistakes where they'll make it parsable and then just start handing it off. But throughout the application lifecycle, it becomes really difficult to understand the bugs that are happening because of the data ownership is distributed all over the place and not going through like centralized channels. And I see that happen a lot with fragments. So general rule for myself, don't put the data into the fragments. Fragments use data and uh, kind of like the MVC approach of trying to just get the data onto the screen. <coughs> now this is something that Google seems to suggest. I think they changed the documentation a little bit to not suggest so heavily on this. But in the past for fragments, they had a big section on how you could have a fragment talk to the activity, and their suggestion is that you write an interface, interface hooks the activity, and anything that the activity needs to know about will just listen to it, and now the activity and fragment might as well be the same code because they're tightly bound together, and moving that fragment to some other activity, which is the entire purpose of them, uh, is now much more difficult. And the worst part about that is when you are writing code, you want to move some fragment to some other activity, it's up to you to know that that fragment has dependencies, like requiring a, uh, an interface implementation of the underlying activity, and the IDE can't help you with that. You're just going to have to run it, and then it crashes. It kind of sucks. So intents. Um, intents obviously help you move the data around. Um, does everybody know what intents are? I feel like that's, uh, they're underused, I feel like, especially with broadcast receivers. But uh, I use these a lot just for moving data around without having to use something like event bus or any other kind of busing system. Um, they're not that heavy. A lot of the uh, things like event bus specifically have benchmarks where they're like, oh, event bus can send a million messages a second on a device. What the hell are you doing that takes a million messages a second? Like, that's the problem. Like, don't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, right? Like, like, they have these benchmarks that just sense like you don't need to do that ever that's a pointless thing um, 
they are useful uh, event buses versus doing broadcast receivers. So if you like or prefer that, awesome. But uh, these work just fine. And then of course services. Uh, services you almost never need. Um, if you're doing something like music or video, you might need a service to help manage things. If you need to work with multiple processes, you might need a service. Otherwise, you're probably just going to use a service to instantiate a background thread because services are not background threads, threads in themselves, so it kind of uh, doesn't make much sense to use them. They do have really useful lifecycle hooks. It's very easy to know when a service has started or stopped. It's very easy to write bindings to a service. Um, so they do have merit just in helping you build. Uh, so if you were going to use them and it's not necessary, I think that's still OK. And of course, any background work uh, improves the GUI. So um, to kind of summarize where I'm going with all this, um, these are some general guidelines that I use. So the first is activities can be a poor location for application logic. And that's what I was getting at with people putting way too much stuff into one class just because it was a convenient place to put it, which obviously isn't a good idea. Um, plan out what you're going to do so you don't have to put everything into an activity just because the activity at that point in time when you wrote it was doing this particular task that you needed to implement. Um, the application class, another one that I don't think gets used very much. It's actually quite useful unless you have a content provider, in which case it'll shoot you. Um, but basically, using an application class or a static class to hold on, like a singleton, is a really good way to drive the flow of information and remove code from fragments, remove code from activities, and just centralize things so you can have some standards of how everything works inside of an application. And then there's a key thing in Android. Uh, it's not so bad now with uh, the AOT, but for all the old phones that are still on JIT, everything you do is expensive when it comes to memory. So keep in mind that when you're instantiating things, that it's going to cost probably twice. And so that's the instantiation and then the garbage collection. And the more objects you instantiate, the more often that garbage collection is going to run, and the more expensive it's going to get. So if you eat up a whole bunch of VM memory on lots of little objects, garbage collection is going to take forever. And there's nothing you can do about it, and it's going to lock everything up, and it sucks. So lastly, serializable. I see this used a lot in examples. Um, coming from the Java world, you use serializable for uh, everything. It's not that expensive, relatively. CPUs are fast. Mobile phones are not fast. And serializable really sucks when you start using it on Android and start passing it through things like intents. I feel like when Google implemented intents to allow serializable and externalizable, it was a huge mistake. They shouldn't have done that. Um, always use parsable. It saves a significant amount of time and a significant amount of storage. If you use serializable a lot, you'll end up actually hitting the one megabyte limit on your intents, which I don't think many people know about because they don't really warn you. Your application will just arbitrarily crash at some point down the road because you exceeded the memory limit. And then, of course, non-static inner classes. And this is more of a, uh, there used to be a memory reason for doing this. But just effectively, when you're writing code and you have non-static inner classes, it becomes really to understand the intent of the code. Now, when you're doing something like an anonymous class for a listener, not too bad. Everybody can probably understand that. But when you have a non-static adapter, for instance, that now the adapter has dependency on some data already being instantiated before adapter lifecycle is called through by the uh, recycler view or list view, that's going to get painful in the future. So just do the work up front. Make everything static if you can. And it'll just uh, make your life a little forward. So that kind of all rolls into start with a plan. Um, this isn't the plan that you should use, but just generally write stuff down. It'll save you a whole bunch of time. And you'll probably discover issues before you actually even started. So don't take the startup mentality of write code as fast as possible, like planning. It'll save you so much time in the long run. And of course, document. Now, uh, compound views. Um, I mentioned those before with fragments being kind of like compound views. but Compound views are literally the view class in Android to do some specific thing, like make a graph, make a custom button that does something. 
you know, draw a picture, uh, whatever it is. These are a great way to move really specific logic, really specific actions into something that is completely portable and only needs minimal input to create whole features inside of apps. So if you use these uh, religiously, you can really make your app very modular, very decoupled from everything that it does. And when it comes time to make those little micro changes, they're easy and you don't, you're not stepping on anybody else's feet. So when somebody else is working with you, you can make the changes that you need to make. So of course, reusable permits the data binding. You could do it both directions if you wanted to. Um, however, the data structure works in your app. That's uh, obviously only applicable. Um, Lifecycle hooks. This is uh, probably a pro and a con. Um, views have a very complex lifecycle, so be careful, especially if you do something like broadcast receivers. Broadcast on views could do something really bad, like tie on to your activity without you knowing about it, and then when you try to figure out why your activities are leaking, well, it's doubly disconnected with the because all you did was register a view, um, a views enter class as a uh, as a broadcast receiver, which unknowingly to you actually held the view inside the memory, which then holds the activity inside the memory, and very quickly you start churning through a whole bunch of memory, and the garbage collection can't help you out. So, be careful with the uh, lifecycle hooks. And default actions on specific events, that's kind of going back to like you could make a button, you could make graphs, you can have default interactions from the user, touching, moving, speaking, whatever it is. The views can operate on those, uh, on those events, whatever they might be. Now modules, everybody's using Android Studio? No, they are. You used it, cool. So everybody, you guys in the back, you've opened it up, looked at it at least once. Yeah, cool. So modules are, when you first open up the uh, Android Studio, you create a new app, and then it has like a little folder and it says add a module. And you can create more modules, like library modules, other applications. And I highly recommend you get really familiar with it, because you wanna want, when you want to write like the one little change to the app, but your app has to connect to the network, and it has to download stuff, and then you have to set up the profiles, it becomes very difficult to test these one little changes. And if you use the modules religiously, you can actually test these changes, implement them, and see them in real time without having to go through the whole step of your app. And it's going to speed up your debugging. It's going to speed up uh, your actual production time. So, um, And they compile much quicker, in my opinion, than what they did in Eclipse when you had like full out libraries. It's been uh, my experience. Does that sound right to you? Yeah? Cool. And then, of course, testing. Uh, modules help with testing. Uh, you don't really have to use Dagger to make really testable code. Modules will help you do that because everything is disconnected. So avoiding it. Um, asynchronous tasks, they're awesome, but I see it get used in a lot, in a lot of ways where people like chain them together. Um, they'll write like uh, asynchronous tasks inside of their activities or inside of their fragments. And that kind of goes back to like make everything static. Well, they don't do that, or they just make them static, and then the class is you know three thousand lines long for all of these asynchronous task operations, which then also comes back to things should be more generic. So if you end up needing like eighteen different asynchronous task operations, you've probably made a mistake because that is way too many different things that your app needs to do, and it's going to be very difficult to test and very difficult to come back and understand what went wrong. So libraries. Libraries are awesome until you have too many dependencies. And when you have problems, you won't understand how to fix them. So be very liberal in the libraries that you pick and the libraries that you choose. Make sure they're tested. Make sure that there's somebody that's uh, reputable on GitHub um, or wherever you got it from. And uh, even things like the Google libraries. Um, the Android Maps uh, API library is a good example where it has really cool features but it's not quite done yet, you know, so just be aware of what you're using and how you're using it. So I originally wrote this uh, talk about a year ago, and one of the things was support libraries. About a year, year and a half ago, support libraries kind of sucked. Um, there were things with fragments that were problems, um, and I think that's the next one. Yeah, the child fragments, if you had to, like, put a view pager inside of a fragment, like, like things got really bad really fast. Uh, 
I think a lot of that's gotten a lot better. Um, and of course, now if you want to support material design, you're kind of stuck. You got to use them. And then annotations. Uh, does everybody know what dagger is? Anybody? No? OK, so everybody knows what annotations are, right? OK, so annotations are awesome. They can add a lot of features. Uh, there's some new, I guess, concepts and things like Dagger will actually help you write simple annotations to provide complex functionality inside of your code, um, specifically doing dependency injection. Everybody understands dependency injection. You have to create a class inside of your class that's dependencies. Um, get really arduous when you have lots of classes that you have to constantly be doing you know new class or maybe it's a singleton well who owns making the singleton when is that going to happen what's the life cycle requirements dependency injection libraries are there to help you fix those problems just be careful with them because that can be a rabbit hole of going uh, the wrong direction very quickly um, and I think verbosity or verbosity is a good thing um, Obviously, having activities with 3,000 lines of code, it's way too much, but there is a middle ground in there. Um, there's plenty of good reasons to have 1,000 lines in one, as long as it's concise. Just stick to good naming, stick to <coughs> sensible methods, and it won't be that bad going forward. And then, of course, butter knife and dagger, two different um, goals for each of those libraries, but both of them are, uh, are annotation-based. And they can definitely help you save time up front, but the time on the tail end of like actually having the app out in the wild and debugging it could bite you if you're uh, not careful and you don't understand what the libraries are doing. And I really like this from their documentation is they have features in Dagger that literally say this and they're showing you how to use it, which is just like mind boggling. Like, like no, don't like if it has to say feature should be used sparingly, you probably shouldn't be using that feature ever for anything. And then Jake Wharton, who wrote Dagger and Butterknife, I found this quote from him on Stack Overflow. So cake without icing sucks, but a cake with five inch icing also sucks. And I think that's really applicable when you are writing code and you're working on your apps. If you don't plan, you end up with a crappy cake. And if you get too involved on little things and trying to save a whole bunch of time, you also have a crappy cake. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'll have the posted, so if you want to look at anything, there will be there. And then I uh, just wanted to do this really quick. So there's a few other minor things that I uh, wanted to go over. So here we have a really simple layout. There's a button. I'll it's at the bottom, and we have an include. Nothing wrong with that. So if we go look at what the, uh, oh no, like tools fighting each other. So this is the actual button, or this is the actual layout that was being included. Now, the problem here is that both buttons were named button, but you had no way to know that. And Android Studio doesn't tell you, and the phone is going to just go ahead and work. So now you have two views, same ID, and if you're working on a team of people, you've now just run into a problem of somebody's going to end up hitting this bug where they think that the, uh, the listener for button A should be working on button B, but it's not, and somebody's going to think B is A. So the idea here is don't use crappy names if, uh, for, for your resource IDs. And I see that a lot of people naming things like submit. That seems fine when you have one button on the screen and that's the only thing it does, right? As soon as you add another button and it has a submit functionality, well, that's not going to be fun. So be verbose with the naming. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, same thing you do with functions. You don't write functions that's function A. Like You'd actually give it a name and a purpose. So just be careful with that. Uh, I'm going to have to turn that off. Nope. Nope. Does that not work? Ah. Sorry, I have a, uh, a Zoom plugin and it is fighting me.
Live demos, they're awesome. All right, so this is the uh, coupled fragments that I was talking about. Um, we have a fragment here that is being added, and everything looks fine, right? Like, we're just going to add it, and there's no errors, except that if I went ahead and tried to run this code, um, it would crash. And the reason is that when the fragment is created, it's going to go ahead and throw an illegal state exception because the activity did not implement the interface, but the activity had no idea that it even needed to do that. And you can see very quickly how that becomes cumbersome. So if you had a fragment that had three or four of these necessary interfaces that the activity needs to implement, that would suck very quick. And uh, I think the Google I.O. app, at least in the past, was a good example of that, where there's just code everywhere. And it was random dependencies like this. So I would just avoid it as much as you possibly can. There are legitimate use cases of where you want to do this, but most of the time, don't. Um, this is uh, kind of going back to the static classes. Uh, this is a good example of where you see people instantiating anonymous classes all over the place, where you should have just done something like this. Have a singularized handler of everything that you need to do, and now it's readable, now you can understand it, versus that, which is not very easy to understand, and it's very cumbersome and taking up lots of lines of code for not any good reason. So. This is a class of packages. Let's see. Nope. Yeah, President Camacho, he had to jump in there. Oh, uh, no. All right, well, not a good one to show. All right, we'll I'll have to skip that one. But so the next one. Um, and this kind of touches on what I was saying about memory leaks. Uh, this is an activity with a memory leak. Um, and this one should hopefully be very obvious to everybody. We have a linked list of listeners. The activity is going to register to the listener and then never deregistered. Now, if you did this with a broadcast receiver, Android is nice enough to blow up on you and say, like, whoa, you major messed up. Uh, you just created a memory leak. And you'll find that at runtime, which is great. But if you write your own listener handlers, um, for doing some specialized thing, well, you can very quickly start consuming a lot of memory, and it can become very unobvious of what you did for that. Oh. So this is something that you can do to help with that. Um, using strict mode, uh, you can get feedback and warnings in real time as you use your apps to tell you, like, hey, like something bad has happened. Um, this doesn't detect everything. But if you tried to do something on the foreground that you shouldn't, like disk I.O., um, if some reason some network code is coming to the foreground and Android didn't crash because of it, that will hopefully be caught. And most importantly, activities. Um, when you do leak an activity, this keeps track of them. And the default permissible amount is 1, which how many, of, uh, how many instances of an activity that you actually want is always 1. So when it sees more than that, it starts logging that to the console for you. So this is really a useful thing to have. But uh, I think that's everything. So I was going to do looking up memory leaks, but if you guys aren't uh, all Android devs, it kind of seems uh, pretty in depth. Yeah? yeah. No? OK. Um, so looking at the strict, uh, yeah, this is Android Studio. Uh, it's just the dark theme. Let's see. Nope. Oh, that's a. Uh... All right. Well, that's not going to work. Hopefully, you guys can see that. So. Anyways, I'm running the activity that has the intentional memory leak in it. And it's running in strict mode. So what we're going to see is this right here, is that the activity is actually leaked. And we can see it every single time that it's telling me that now it's just leaking more and more. So now we have six, seven, eight instances of the activity, which is obviously really bad. And if you were to look at the GC events, you can see the GC events are now stacking up higher and higher runtimes. 
So if you get this up into like 40 or 50 uh, leaked activities, you'll, your GC will start running in like 100, 200 milliseconds, even on a really fast device. So very quickly, your performance is going to degrade. So to fix that, you can uh, jump over to uh, the device monitor, and you're going to run and select the heap up in the top left, and then you're going to dump the, uh, the profile of the memory. Now, this is going to take a second. We get a save dialog, and we're going to throw this into uh, a folder I already created down here. And we just save that. So there is one more step. Uh, when they moved from Eclipse to Android Studio, they kind of broke this process. You used to be able to just hit that little dump button, and then you got an already fixed profile. And the reason you need a fixed one is because Android Dalvik is different from the Java JVM. And the Java tools only expect a Java JVM um, profile. So there is an Android tool called uh, HProf Convert. And if you see that, it just expects an in file and an out file. So I'm just going to give it my in file and out file names. And it's going to make that. And the next thing that you need is the Eclipse Memory Analyzer. Uh, there are other ones that are paid that uh, offer more or less features. But this one is free. So you get that. You run it. And it looks like this. So we're going to go open the. Um, the prof file that we created. It does a little bit of work. And it gives you a nice little graph about what's using memory. Um, now, these three pie pieces are pretty typical in almost all applications. And you can ignore them, because they're Android dependencies, like resources, um, lifecycle stuff. And there's nothing there. But how do you actually find the memory leak? Well, if you come over to the uh, histogram chart, you can actually just type in uh, your package name. So just do that really quick. Oops. And now we have a lot less to look at. So this is great. And we can see right here that this is called activity with leak. So we know that that was the one that we intentionally created. And we can see that it says nine objects. And that matches up with what we saw here is that it said eight instances, and the limit is one. So the ninth activity was created. There's eight other ones. That's the issue. So we know nine is the total. So we look there. We see nine. That's excellent. So how do we actually find where the memory leak occurred? Well, you can come to merge shortest path to GC roots, exclude weak references, because those don't count. And now we have only two possible sources of where the leak came from. The first one uh, that we want to look at is this view input method. And we can see that it only references one instance of an activity. So that's clearly not it. This other one references eight. So we can see right there that listeners is the culprit. And if we go back to Android Studio, we can see that listeners is actually the name of the linked list that we created that is the culprit of, hand, uh, of holding on to all of these rogue activities. So this is a very straightforward and simple um, memory leak. They get much, much worse. Like I was saying with broadcast receivers, those ones can be a real pain to find. But uh, that's like a quick tutorial of how you would actually find a memory leak. So that's a great way to also get a lot of performance out of your apps, is get rid of the memory leaks. But, but I think that, that is actually it. So cool. Questions, comments? Yeah, I generally have a hard time designing apps. Um, technically, when you have a choice of activity, fragment, fragment activity. Um, like, um, could you tell me how you would design an app if it had a uh, navigational, uh, navigational drawer and you have uh, four items in terms of um, how you construct it between um, activities and fragments? Sure. So. With the nav drawer, um, the obvious intent is that you are going to use fragments. Um, that would be the traditional use case. Uh, you could work around it by using compound views um, and getting clever with pulling things on and off screen and using complex animations. Um, I've certainly done that before, but it's not fun and it's not an easy thing for beginners to do. Uh, so with that kind of approach, 
um, using the boilerplate, and I think Android Studio even has this now. If you come to a uh, new project, I'm just going to go ahead and say yes to all that. You get presented with this screen, and I uh, think this one right here is a navigation drawer activity. So we're just going to do that. So I guess the actual answer to your question is just use the boilerplate code. It's pretty much exactly what you want. And when you want to do the tweaks, like this makes it a little bit easier. So right out of the box, we get an actual fragment set up. And we have the navigation drawer fragment. So you can go ahead and just start using that and adding the fragments that you need. So does that answer the question? Or is Um, I think most people would expect the response to be a fragment. Um, with the navigation drawer, I don't think switching activities is generally what the intended function was meant to be. Because I, I think when you have the drawer open, you shouldn't be leaving the drawer to go somewhere else. Um, you should expect that something in the background is going to change, the drawer is going to go away, and then you have that right there. What if it's a modal view? A modal view? Do what? It's an activity. It's kind of good. Okay. So, so what's the? So is that like you still have the question there, or you just mix it up? Okay. Um, I think just generally though, uh, if you're not going to follow the traditional navigation drawer um, style, don't do it. <laughs> just use something else because um, it gets confusing. And there's a lot of apps that have like gone their own path, like having a. Uh, the navigation drawer behind the activity. So when you start sliding, it's clearly in the background. And then it's on like both sides. Like if anybody's using Slack, the Slack app is a good example of where like you really shouldn't do that because it's just confusing and, uh, and unnecessary. Like there is other ways that you can achieve the same thing the navigation drawer provides by not using it. Anybody else? Uh, Ion, that's about it. <laughs> um, I'm fortunate that my work has the money to just pay me to work. Um, so if I think it's worth spending time on, we'll just spend time and roll our own solution for whatever we need. Um, now, I'm definitely not against libraries. Uh, I'm just strongly against making your apps dependent on third-party code. And what I mean by that is um, things like Dagger, where if Dagger support ends, well, your app entirely depends on Dagger. You can't just go remove Dagger and then make your app work in a couple of minutes. Um, whereas if you use something like some kind of special image view that does one little feature, well, if that library goes away, that's not a big deal. You can go replace that. So I'm much more for libraries that add features instead of libraries that add dependency of uh, how your code actually works and functions. So, uh, so because of that, I would say Ion is it's pretty much it outside of using things like JSON and other like low level, more Java esque um, features. I guess I have a quick question. Uh, so, when you pulled up that tool that like converted the profile to mm -hmm. that, the main analyzer, <coughs> do you know what that's actually doing? Um, yeah, so it's just getting rid of, well, when, when it was, uh, if this was a Dalvik phone, it'd be doing a lot because it's taking all of the Dalvik. Uh, like calls and traces and converting them to what the Java tools would expect to see. So really, it's just a side effect of having their own virtual machine. Okay, and so the, the way the virtual machine works is just completely different from the JVM. Now that they've moved yeah. to AOT, you actually see files that are almost the exact same size. Like the conversion tool, mm -hmm. you get almost an identical file out okay. the other side. But it is still different. Yeah, okay, cool. But uh, the H, uh, it's hprofconf for hprof convert, yeah. and that's in the build tools of the Android SDK. So okay, cool. everybody already has that. Um, mine's just already on the uh, on the path. Cool. So anybody else? Somebody from the back? That's not that guy? <laughs> no? Cool. Thanks, guys. Bad for anybody like watching, just like, grabbing it and like, smashing it. With fingers. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs>
I guess to say, don't give me your phone. I don't need that. Don't stand up here the whole time. Woohoo! Okay. Really quickly, too, while Eric is setting up, um, they've started doing the marketing for it now. So, Tech Week. Orlando Tech Week is April 13th through the 18th, and they're ending it with bar camp. So that's the last day of Tech Week. So reach out to me if you want to know anything else. Otherwise, it's on Orlando Tech's website now. So pretty excited about all that. Is bar camp the events, the conference? Yeah, it's like on the north side of town. Yeah, it's at the Cheyenne. Yep. And I think it's going to be in April from here on out. I don't remember There'll when. There's a whole section on that, right? As long as it's mobile. Uh, pretty much where I was. Most of them are something. Oh, I, think, I think what I was thinking of is code camp. Is that? Nothing? No? No. There's a bunch of JavaScript. Here you can set up this. Yeah. No, I've never heard of code camp. I don't think anybody gave me Android Talks. There was Ruby, there was JavaScript, oh, there was iOS. That was a long Saturday. <laughs> I was lucky to be there. Mm. Uh, is that the one that did good? <laughs> yeah, that was the one that did good. <laughs> I went to so half of it good. and then I left. Right yeah, I, I, I left at like I mean, For me, it was just mostly two. networking because uh, yeah. all of that is. Um, it can get worse. Like they, they, like when I was IO, uh, they didn't let anybody into the main room until like 30 minutes before. And then, uh, we're still trying to get in an hour into the presentation. So we were in the cafeteria watching on the laptop, and the lady was like, Hey, can you guys come over here? And I was like, Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
right there. Maybe we may have had a pop up. Yeah, I didn't see. I wasn't paying but, uh, attention. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. There you go. <laughs> I have like 40 emails from Jenkins or anything. Is he just running? These are from earlier. No, he was manually running them. Oh, dude, he got so embarrassed when he realized that Jenkins is integrated with Slack. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Oops. Cool. So, hello everybody. I don't think anybody can hear me. Can you guys hear me in the back? Everybody ready? Cool. Got everybody's attention. So, I'm going to be talking about augmented reality today. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, Vuforia's SDK. Uh, it's been around for a few years, probably about three years now. Um, I have a lot of people I've spoken to in here have already messed with it before. Uh, I'm going to be talking more about the API calls, general best practices, and kind of how to manage the general life cycles for events like Smart Terrain, which I'll be giving you guys a demo as well. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm mainly a freelance developer and a student. Uh, I do cybersecurity at Valencia and computer science at UCF. Um, as a uh, urban dictionary, Definition goes, a programmer is an organism capable of converting caffeine into code, which I feel applies to a lot of people <laughs> as far as developers go. Um, so what kind of experience can you get from augmented reality? So what kind of is the point of augmented reality? What is it? How can it benefit your app? How can you add it to your app? What kind of benefits will come from it? Um, so first of all, we've got to kind of get an understanding of what is augmented reality. So augmented reality is a live or direct indirect view of a physical real world environment whose elements are augmented or supplemented by computer generated graphics uh, for sensory inputs such as uh, sound, video, uh, and graphics. So I did have three options to choose from. Uh, first was uh, Wikitude, and then we had Matayo, and then of course we had uh, Vuforia. Uh, as far as Wikitude goes, uh, it's an AR ready browser. Uh, it natively uh, relies heavily on web-based technologies like HTML5, HTML, um, CSS. But uh, for our sake of our, what we wanted to use, I wanted to use a lot of 3D animations. So I needed something like Unity support just because I've had a lot of experience with scripting in Unity. So uh, uh, Vuforia just kept coming back as a ready option. Uh, the next option was Matayo. Uh, it's a popular choice for bigger companies, big companies like uh, Honda, Ben & Jerry's, which God knows why Ben & Jerry needs augmented reality. Um, but we even like Red Bull has sponsors uh, with augmented reality. Uh, and then, of course, Euphoria. Uh, a few of the features that stood out from Euphoria, which made me want to use it for the project that I was running, uh, is the HD camera view, extended tracking, smart terrain, and object recognition. I'll go in more into detail on, on what those mean and what they are. Uh, it's very reliant as far as the SDK on C++ and Java, since it is an Android SDK. Um, the Unity side, a lot of it's going to be, well, a lot of the scripting side is going to be in C Sharp, so that's JavaScript. Um, so, so what is Euphoria? Uh, Euphoria is, uh, is an SDK developed by Qualcomm. Uh, it's the mobile vision offering, so basically it's just a, an app, uh, an SDK that allows your app to see, so it gives you uh, components and an engine that would actually run this augmented reality, allows you to see with the camera, and it allows you to uh, provide an overlay on top of the actual environment, which will allow you to give you to basically essentially set, a, set up a tabletop instance um, using this augmented reality engine. Uh, so there are differences in trackables that you have to support. So unfortunately, as of right now, they are trying to support uh, more of a custom target uh, definition. But for now, you do have to uh, work with their predefined targets. So you do have to uh, use their developer portal to set up a predefined target. Uh, the one that gives you the most amount of control would be the user-defined target, which then is going to be a lot more of like a 3D model. So you're going to have more something like a toy car. Uh, what that allow you to do is you can actually pick up the object. object uh, make like a 3D mesh for it, which will use the actual depth sensing technologies and the computer vision technologies to, to detect this. And you can kind of put like an overlay on top of the car, which it'll track. So even as like, say, a kid is moving around a car and you wanted to play, say, like a, a force field around this car, you can have that object defined and then have that force field over it and have it kind of collide with some of the collisions that you have on the um, board as well. Um, so of course, there's image targets, text word targets. So you can actually have it recognize a set of words uh, in a set specific set of font. Um, as well as multi-target, so if you wanted to set up an actual full range tabletop experience, uh, a lot of times, and, and like for example, there's features like extended terrain, which allow you to kind of, kind of veer off the intended target, um, but you're going to lose a little bit of your tracking, so setting up multi-targets would give you more of a robust experience. So if you wanted to set up like four point trackers around the corners, you know, one in the middle, it would give you more control over that. 
Um, cloud recognition targets is just basically you can uh, upload the actual cloud-based uh, defined targets on their cloud base. It can get you, I think it's about to about 1,000 uh, data sets that you can upload on there. Um, this is kind of an overview of the graph of how it works, uh, especially the developer side. This is what you're going to mainly be working with is the mobile application. Um, as far as the target management system, uh, the way that works is you're taking a predefined image. So say it's a cylindrical target, you would have to have like a logo wrap of the image in say a PNG format. Um, specific specifically, they want RGB. I came in here the other day uh, talking to you about that, what specifically RGB it was, but it was RGB that I think they needed uh, either grayscale RGB or, I mean, I'm sorry, grayscale or RGB 13 bit. I mean, I'm 24 bit. 24 -bit. Dude, I completely lost it. I wasn't working with it too much. It was kind of something I was exploring a little bit, but I, I kind of uh, pushed it aside when I couldn't really convert it in Photoshop. Um, so I kind of use more of the image target systems. Um, so you're going to be uploading that on their website, and it'll basically output either, if you're working with Unity, it'll upload uh, and output a Unity package which, can you, which you can activate within your environment, or a Android XML format, um, a manifest, uh, or just an XML format to actually let you upload those data sets within your app and call upon them. Um, as far as the app sets, app assets, logic, and rendering, um, basically your logic is what you're kind of applying to everything that's being updated. So as you're rendering targets, as you're picking up uh, definitions, as you're loading your trackers, you basically have to use your app logic to render how you want to, uh, what kind of results you want to have. And whenever I go over smart terrain, I'll kind of go more into detail on how you can apply that app logic as well. Uh, as far as the rendering engine components, there are four components that you kind of need to initialize. Um, there's the AR camera, the image converter, the tracker, and the video background renderer. Um, as far as the four components, the AR camera, all it does is it captures the preview frames um, and sends it to the uh, camera stack to be converted, um, or basically to the tracker, where it's going to be converted using the image converter, which basically just converts it to an open, uh, open GLES rendering format, so basically so that they can actually track things like luminance internally. Um, this basically gives dance, down samples the camera into a resolution that the actual augmented reality <coughs> engine can work with, as opposed to uh, your camera dependent device image. So for example, when you're taking the image, say I have a Sony camera, I have a, a 20 megapixel camera on my phone, it'll take any resolution regardless of your megapixels, uh, use that converter to uh, put it in a format that it can recognize, apply the computer vision algorithms and um, uh, within the actual tracker uh, and then output it into like a state object which you're going to use that state object to basically call any functions and to control the actual components. Um, so the video background renderer, all it does is initially, so if you're thinking of it in a point of view of a, of a chart, I say, um, you have the AR camera which essentially is capturing, uh, your, so just the camera, so you're seeing the camera, this is what you see live. It sends it to the tracker which on the way it does get uh, converted to an OpenGL format and then it goes to the video background renderer which the renderer is basically just pulling up the camera so it's basically giving you another instance of that camera internally which is using to augment the overlay on top of. So it's using that as the overlay, uh, like the canvas in a sense to overlay the augmented reality on top of. Uh, as far as the application code, as I uh, mentioned, you do have to uh, initialize those four components um, in your code just to get it to initialize the basic component and get the engine started. Um, there are three things that you want to do. Uh, as soon as that you're finished with that, you want to query the state object for the new de newly detected star uh, targets and updated states of these elements. So say, for example, you have a flat image target like this. As you have a user going around it or as it's moving, you need to uh, be prepared for that. So basically, you need to be able to call and query uh, consistently with the camera to know as this, being, uh, as this, being, this is being translated, you want to be able to follow that within the code so you can actually change what is being rendered on top and actually give it that full geometry and that ground truth reference to uh, the tabletop that you have it on top of. Uh, you also want to update the application logic. Uh, I was going to go more into that, and then render the augmented overlay, obviously, on top of that. Uh, so one of the features that specifically stood out to me was the ins extended tracking. Uh, so it basically enables the app to have a degree of persistence when tracking the subject. So even whenever you have uh, a uh, image target that's on a flat surface, but you want to see somewhat of a bigger defined uh, augmented reality. So a lot of a lot of things that come to mind, and when you think of this, are and I'll give examples for that as well are things, for example, like large furniture. So if you have furniture, applications, uh, large homes, so basically TVs, things like that. Um, let's say, for example, you have a uh, table in front that you want to see how the size of this TV is. You can add it to your client's app and say they're selling an electronics company, they're selling radios, TVs, anything, whatever it could be. If you have this 3D model, you can render that 3D model. Um, and since this actually has a truth reference as far as how the size of this, so it knows exactly how many uh, millimeters this 
paper is. It can give you an actual reference using the environment to infer the exact location, the exact size, and the exact geometry of that target. So you can actually place this TV or you can select the exact size that you want, whether it's 45, 55 inch, and it would use that ground truth reference to uh, give you a flat picture, just right, or a flat 3D image on top of that. So I actually have a demo app with extended reality or with the extended tracking as well. And in the name of Dragon Age Android, I did make it somewhat dragon based. Um, let's see. Yeah, exactly. So I thought I'd go with it. So I don't know if you guys want to <coughs> kind of see this, but let me get it started. Actually, I have to install it. So I guess I'll start off for now and I'll just show the image of it and then I'll show you guys the app as I install it. So what I did was I have the uh, image target that I set up and that does have to be predefined. And then I have the augmented dragon on top of it basically using an animation clip to basically loop the animation of it flying. So even whenever I point my actual camera slightly above, so say I want to go into more textures and see more with, of what's inside the dragon, uh, I'm not going to lose that tracking target. So uh, the reason that that's beneficial is because sometimes when you want to add a level of immersion into your games, so say you're setting up a tabletop experience, you can actually use this to look inside of buildings. So let's say you do have like a tower that's being rendered, you can actually go up to this augmented tower and see the inner workings of this tower. So if you have some kind of mesh dynamically made on, on the, uh, the tower, so you can actually have the physics and colliders, so you can actually have units uh, responding with this actual uh, terrain. So extended tracking pretty much supports all of the same image targets except for word targets. Um, as far as what kind of implementation you need as far as the actual tabletop reference, it's good to have a plain surface. So essentially not having too much details within your tabletop. Uh, painted walls work felt wells uh, just because you're getting a flat surface. The reason is because your augmented reality is consistently looking for a border to kind of set the stage for its augmented reality. So because of that, if you have something that has multiple lines, say tiles with grout, it's going to consist of, of, of thousands of mini stages in the rendering <coughs> camera. So it's not going to be able to properly render on top of what it needs to. Uh, so uh, the next feature I'm going to be talking about and the one of the biggest ones that I've been working with is Smart Terrain. Uh, the cool thing about Smart Terrain is that it enables you to reconstruct and augment your physical environment to create new kinds of gaming and visualization applications. Um, so what that means is basically it's adding new dimensions and mobile experiences and enables you to reconstruct your environment to create your own play spaces. So this is what you would need if you want uh, a tabletop experience. This is a close to mid experience. Uh, it's something you would use for tabletop experiences if you wanted to, say, recreate a... Um, say a Warhammer game. So you wanted to create a live augmented game on top of a tabletop. Uh, or let's say um, <coughs> more of a, I would say Smart Train would be more for use for something if you wanted to interact with your outer environment. So whenever you're generating a, a, a standard game, you're going to have any, anything kind of just placed on a, pl uh, a linear plane. Um, what you would want with Smart Terrain is to interact with your actual environment. So you'd actually have it pick up props that are around. Um, and I'll go into the API calls on that. But essentially, it can pick up the props that you have on the table, which are not predefined. Um, it does not need to have a predefined target. Um, and what it'll do is it'll create a uh, box collider uh, using the rough ground truth reference that it has from here. It'll give you a rough example of what these are, and then it'll uh, provide a box collider, a boundary box around it, which can be used to apply any kind of colliders and, and physics within Unity. Um, it does follow event-driven programming model. So what that means is the program programming paradigm is that it follows uh, an event. Uh, basically, it follows a loop that's a flow of events. So as this loop is being caused, it waits for events. And upon events, it, it sends a trigger back to the tracker, which you can use. So as far as the Smart Terrain demo, uh, this is one that I have set up here as well. So what I showed was on the actual tabletop, I played my, placed my uh, image target within the middle. I had a tower uh, augmented reality once the target was located. Uh, and then I had the, the uh, colliders or the bounding boxes. What I set up was a basic uh, material shader, which is just used for the greenness. And then I just set up a wireframe behavior to just kind of like augment this. Normally, you don't want to show these wireframes. It's just more for like when you're showing developers, it kind of gives you a better understanding of how it's adapting to the terrain around it and establishing this, this uh, ground truth reference and, and kind of setting the stage for the tabletop experience. Uh, once you have these bounding boxes from there, you can actually set uh, any kind of app logic. So the way that works is since this does have ground truth reference and it does know how many millimeters and centimeters and diameters, roughly how tall these things are, you can set an app logic to if it's over 10 centimeters, do this. If it's less than 10 centimeters, do this. So if your, your, your gain logic was to, say, set up a 
tabletop experience for a tower defense game. Uh, you can have it set up natively with the uh, props that are being created and have the collider say that, when, or they have the uh, bounding box say that, or the app logic on the bounding box say that if it's less than 10 centimeters, make it into a hill. If it's more than 10 centimeters, create it into a tower. Create it, if it's more than 50 centimeters, make it into a castle. You can kind of inform and, and, and adjust the terrain live as you're working with it. Um, this is kind of the call flow summary. So basically within the API calls, this is how it kind of works. You start off with start mesh updates, and then you're ending with stop mesh updates. Mesh updates are the initial what's, what's being surrounding or, or what's surrounding your image target and what's creating the uh, mesh on top of the table. So what it's using to distinguish what is the table and what is not. Um, as far as the components, you have on surface updated. So you're going to want to call this. And anything that's, so as the surface is being updated, it's being called back to uh, surface abstract behavior, which we're assigning to surface behavior. Um, at this point, you want to inform the target that something is happening. So as soon as you initialize your target, a best practice would be to say, OK, you've got this uh, image tracked. So we have the trackers. We're loading the trackers. Now you want to pull back slowly and then slowly translate the device. So you want to pull it back. So you don't want them to freak out. So a common thing with a lot of the demos that I show, uh, people look at it, and then they go, oh my god, have you seen this? And then they lose the tracker. So then all of a sudden, when you're trying to reestablish the tracker, it just takes a little bit longer to get back on it. So when you have the actual tracker located on top of it, with the surface update, it's good to let them know. Say, hey, you're pulling it back. Pull it back, and then slowly translate the device slightly just to get a better depth of the field, um, just so you can build it better. And then, so on prop created, that's basically just a callback that's called whenever uh, it detects a prop. So whenever it does detect a prop, it, it's going to give you a on prop <coughs> created, which is basically a prop. All it is is an undefined target. Uh, so it's basically something that it's found, uh, not something that's been uh, predefined in the actual tracker. Um, Next is the associating prop. So what this is doing is basically this is where you're going to set any kind of app logic is within the prop template. Uh, so from here, you're going to set uh, any kind of logic within the bounding box. You're going to set any kind of app logic. So if you wanted it to change or, or dynamically update, uh, you would do it within the associate prop uh, API. And then the most important pa uh, part of this is the on prop updated and on prop deleted. Uh, reason being is because this API call is very important. So I do have the Smart Terrain app here. Um, and so for this demo, one of the functions that we have, so I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but once it detects the actual function, it starts to build the terrain. So it'll start to build the terrain as you tra uh, translate the device back. If you want to stand up, you guys can see this as well. That's why I wanted the Chromecast, because then I could have just... And so what it'll do is as you move the actual target around, it'll update the, the actual terrain, so it starts to detect the props. So as you can see, it detected these uh, locations and then put a prop and put a bounding box. Uh, so the reason that this becomes up important to have this on prop updated is because what happens when you run into a situation where you have two objects that are completely next to each other? So sometimes in the actual tracker, so if I reset the app, it's going to detect this as just being one prop. So say this is so close together, but I'm you know, looking at it at an angle, so it's going to detect it as being one single prop. So whenever I, I capture my instance, I start building my terrain, and I have this prop, it's going to detect it as one, generally one prop. Obviously, but depending on lighting conditions, we'll see how it works. Oh, here, I have a picture. It's not working as much. But so you guys can have a visual reference. Um, this was a standard stage that I set up at home as well. So I have a, if you guys ever had mate, it's an, or an Argentinian tea. It's freaking delicious. Um, so I had the Red Bull and I had Mate and then I had just an a object in the back just to kind of show the depth. So as you can see, it, it detects it as one long object. Uh, just because of the ground truth reference, it's only showing as one perspective. It only sees that side. Um, so what I do is when you translate the device, it will actually on surface update. It will update the actual prop and then take the old instance of this one large prop and delete it and replace it with the two new uh, queried objects. So that way you actually have uh, more, gr more of an actual accurate representation. Um, and then from here, since you do have a dynamic mesh that's being built here, uh, you can set up physics and you can set up, say, like uh, what I was initially trying to plan uh, by the meetup, which I didn't get done in time, was to set up a ray casting player model. So you can actually traverse across that terrain. So you can actually have units. So once this is set, you have one of two options. You can either have uh, the arena established dynamically or have it uh, predefined. So you can have it build <coughs> upon app logic or you can have it uh, user generated. So you can have it so the user can input what is going to be drawn here. So you can have like a kind of like a Sims game where you can draw the surface on the bottom kind of color the bottom uh, and then pick what you want upon these boundary boxes. Um, I forgot what that other point I was getting at was. 
But yeah, so that's basically the point. So the whole point was the Raycast, so you can actually uh, work with this dynamically. So it does have a mesh on top of it, so you do have a flat plane to work off of. Um, and so that's the importance of the on-prop updated. So that is all. Uh, I did add the GOAT, just because I feel like that's something that seems to come up at every single meetup. Um, I'm going to be posting the source for the actual app on GitHub. I do have the extended tracking app and the Smart Terrain app, so I'll be posting both on them so you can kind of dissect them and see how they work. Um, and then if you guys have any questions or if you guys anything you guys come up with, what's up? When it identifies a prop, you use it like a, a mesh uh, If you move it, uh, it follows, right? So you, you do have that option. So you want to set it as a concrete instance if you want to work with any kind of app logic. You can make it work dynamically so you can move the objects. But the thing is, when you get to stop mesh updates, typically you want to, for resource fee reasons or for lifecycle reasons, uh, you want to have it so once they set the terrain, they're going to stop the mesh updates. So within the stop mesh updates, you're not stopping the augmented uh, reality. You're stopping the general, the building upon. So basically setting these colliders, uh, setting these bounding boxes. So when you stop that mesh update, if you were to move that subject, it would keep the actual uh, whatever you've built there, but it won't actually uh, be able to. Like it would basically, actually, essentially, if you don't make it a concrete instance, it would just disappear. So as soon as, soon as you lose it, it can't track it anymore. It's not going to set that bounding box on it. But if you set it as a concrete instance, you should be able to move it, and it kind of should be able to stay there just because it's set and it has this reference. If you covered it with your hand, if you can still see the tracker, you'll still see everything augmented. Uh, it'll probably augment over your hand just because it's an overlay. It's not actually uh, trying to put it into the actual environment. So if you put your hand over it, you'll see the actual augment on your hand. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, so you said I can interact with this dynamically, right? Correct. So how am I, how, from, if I'm at a certain point, how am I getting to the next point? And if I'm a computer, if I'm like, NPC or something like that. Mm. Let's say I create a game with this. How 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 are these players moving? Like, what's the way that they? How are they knowing where to move? So you kind of have two options. One was what I was mentioning earlier as far as ray casting. You do can, can set up uh, ray casting just to, in, in Unity makes it a lot easier just because you can uh, set it to ray cast upon physics. So uh, it does generate physics as far as the uh, mesh on top of the table. So if you have ray casting bouncing off that, uh, you can also have, if you say your game logic was for a tower defense game, you can set like a, a plane on top of this mesh and then say you, you want to set up uh, specific maps that would allow indentation. You can set up like a grid format and maybe do like a, a, a path algorithm so you can set toward the center so kind of have like so you have any spawned units will go toward the center and then kind of set like a pathing algorithm so that way you can actually have them all go toward that source um, and it'll since it does uh, provide colliders upon the projects they will actually go around them uh, depending on your unit logic they can climb up on top of it they do have full physics upon uh, the actual props as well so you know um, they have a best practices app out, which is like a penguin app. Um, but as far as like uh, full on gaming, no, I haven't seen too much on, as far as like on the Play Store um, or uh, the iOS market. Uh, although I have seen a few mainstream applications, like I believe Sony was working on making their augmented TV um, so that way they can demo TVs. Uh, I also saw, um, I believe McDonald's did a small promotional. I don't know if they used Vuforia, but what they had it set up was uh, so you had your fries cup, which had the predefined image. So you downloaded their app and you set the fries cup and you had like cups or whatever. So you're shooting at it from an angle. So you can actually throw a, uh, say like a soccer ball. And since these bounding boxes have put the colliders on them, you can actually bounce off using like, you know, rigid body or whatever. It'll bounce off of it and go toward that goal center. So uh, those are some of the capabilities, but there's obviously, it's the, the limit is just whatever you can think of and what you can go with it within uh, the parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, rephrase the question. I'm sorry. Say it again. Um, so if you if you wanted to make like a game, like a say like a movie, and you wanted to um, actually deploy the package on onto the marketplace, would you would do it directly from Unity, or would you? Uh, I if you're adding it to a pre-existing app, no. If you're doing it directly, so if you're working, your envi entire environment is in Unity, so you're setting up a GUI system within Unity and everything. Uh, yeah, you could just compile it, build settings, you know, set your player options, and then um, go ahead and save it. Matayo is is they have a licenses fee of twenty five. I don't think you said how much this one costs. Oh, it's uh, free. 
Euphoria is free. They have an open, I believe they have an open license for it, so you can kind of publish for it without having to kind of pay any royalties uh, for using their platform. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So. Uh, more of a comment. Super cool would have been the goat standing. I, he, you know what's funny? You say that because I downloaded four different models for goats to try to get the dragon to eat the goat. I tried so hard, but every single goat uh, file I found was either an object file that I could not get the material, like the, uh, the kind of the materials to stick to the actual object file. So it was just, it was a, a nightmare. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll just skip that. Uh, I did have a cool demo later. I can show you guys if you guys after meet me afterwards. I did have the extended demo on the actual back of a dollar bill. So I used a, uh, I predefined a dollar bill, generic back of a dollar bill, which it, it just had enough inf uh, trackers on it. So that way it can pick off of any dollar bill. Uh, so whenever I'm looking at the dollar bill, I can have the dragon render on top of that. And it's just any dollar bill you can pull out as well. I am working currently on a game. Uh, I don't want to reveal too much about it because it'd be something I'd be interested in bringing to the actual floor uh, at one point as well, just to show you guys. Um, but yes, I am absolutely very much. Cool. Any other? That's it. Okay. That's the thing with the goat. I told us that. I. I <laughs> <laughs>